Hi, and welcome to the Hands-On Lab for Auto Rest with JSON Relational Duality Views. My name is William Masden, and I will be taking you through this workshop. If you don't already have an environment, make sure to go to livelabs.oracle.com, search for Auto Rest, and then click on Run on Live Lab Sandbox. After a few minutes, you'll have an environment ready to go. I've already created my environment, and this is what it looks like. So let's get started. First off, we are going to start ORDS. This will allow us to interact with our database through REST calls that we will use later. We can confirm that ORDS is running after going to a new window in Google Chrome and pasting in this address. Now we can return to the terminal and start resetting our user's password on the database. We will log in to SQL CL, a SysDBA, alter our session to our pluggable database, and then we can alter the user and change its password. For this workshop, I will be using password123. Once we've reset that password, we can now log in as this user onto our PDB. Just as a precaution, I can run these drop if exist commands to make sure our database is ready for our tables. Next, I will run the SQL commands to create the four tables we will be using in this workshop. A team, driver, race, and driver race map table. I will also create a trigger that helps update the information in our tables. With our tables now created, I can begin creating my JSON relational duality views. The first one we see here is for the race duality view. It is constructing a JSON document that has an object for each race, and within that object, information about the placements of each driver in the race. Next, I will create a driver duality view that has an object per driver and information about the driver's team and the races they participated in. Lastly, I'll create a team duality view that provides an object per team and provides information about the drivers assigned to that team. These duality views will give us both read and write access to the underlying tables, but through a JSON structure. So we will be able to insert on these duality views and those insert statements will translate to the tables underneath. We can also provide permissions to each one of these tables, as you see with insert, update, and delete clauses at the end of each table. Some tables we do not want to be updated through duality views. For example, updating a driver through the driver duality view, we should not be allowed to change an entire team. So we provide that team with a no insert, no update, and no delete clause. Now that our duality views have been created, we can run a simple PLSQL command to enable those duality views to be used with ORDs and through REST API calls. With all of our setup completed, we can now run a sample curl command to get from our driver duality view. Currently, it of course has no items within it as we have not inserted into it, but we do see we get a successful response back from the database. In our next lab, we will be populating through our JSON relational duality views. Our first step is to download some simple files we will be using to insert data into our database. With those files downloaded, we can now use the first one called teammercedes.json to insert that JSON document into our database. We can paste this curl command and run it, and we will see a 200 response from the database indicating a success. This has not only inserted the Mercedes team into the team table, but also the underlying driver objects within the JSON document. So we have inserted three rows, one into our team table and two into our driver table. 
We can also utilize a bulk insert command to insert more than one JSON document at a time. This next team.json document contains both the Red Bull team and the Ferrari team. With this curl command, we can insert both documents that not only include the two teams, but also the four drivers a part of them. We can see we got a 200 success message from the database as well as the number of rows processed, too. We can run a very similar command to insert races into our database with another successful call to the database and three processed rows. In the next lab, we will be querying our duality views through curl commands. This first curl command will query the entire driver duality view where we can see we have access to the information we have already inserted. This includes all of the driver information as well as their team associations. Next, we can query a specific document by supplying an ID. We can search with ID 105 for the George Russell driver row. Here we see just the information from George Russell's row entry into the duality view. Next, we can also query by parameters, searching for where race name equals Bahrain Grand Prix. Doing so will return a document that corresponds to our query parameter search. While we have been using the terminal to run all of our curl commands, we can also utilize the web IDE for ORDs. By logging in to the link we went to earlier, we can go to the rest section and then click on auto rest. And here we will see our rest enabled duality views. By clicking on the race duality view and the open API view, we can use open AI to visualize our calls. Here I can search on the same query by parameter search and see that it generates a curl command, a request URL, as well as a response body for our call. You can continue using this IDE if you would like, but we will continue with using Terminal. This next lab is focused on updating our duality views. We will first run a get command to get information about the entry we want to update. We specifically want to get the E tag of our entry. The E tag is like a version number. If we supply it to our update command, the database will ensure it matches the existing E tag before updating to ensure that you are working with the most up to date information. In the JSON file that we will be using to update this information, we need to supply the correct E tag. So we can copy from the get call and paste into our .json file. Once we have saved and exited out of this file, we can run another curl command to update the file we were just looking at. We get a 200 response indicating success and a payload describing the update we made. However, now the information on that entry has changed. So if we run the same command again using the same e tag, we will get a failure as the data we used is now out of date, out of sync with the database. Our next task will include switching drivers between teams by only updating the team duality view. We can run a get on the team duality view and see that the Mercedes team has Louis Hamilton and George Russell, and the Ferrari team has Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz Jr. With our updating documents, we are going to add Charles Leclerc to Mercedes and add George Russell to the Ferrari team. The first call will update the Mercedes team to now include Louis Hamilton and Charles Leclerc. The second call will update the Ferrari team to now include George Russell and Carlos Sainz Jr. With these changes in place, we can now see the updated teams by querying the team duality view. We could also query the same information 
by using a query by parameter searching for George and Charles. This will show that the same update was translated from the team duality view to the driver duality view, reinforcing the idea that all of these operations are happening on the same underlying data on our tables. Next we can try to update a non-updatable field. In the declaration of our JSON duality view, we specified some fields as non-updatable. By attempting to update such a field with a update call, we will return with an error, stating that that field is not updatable. Lastly, we can delete from our duality views using a delete request from curl, returning a response that one row was deleted. We can also, of course, delete with query by parameter, receiving the same success message. Thank you so much for spending your time here with me today. I hope you learned a lot about duality views, and if you'd like, please try out Live Labs for any other hands-on labs. Hey everyone, so I am going to be diving into operational property graphs within 23AI on the Oracle database. So operational property graphs, they're essentially a view that's overlaid onto your relational tables that once it's utilized, it's going to allow you to use graph algorithms and find hidden patterns and other hidden insights within your data and within your applications. So this is the hands-on portion and I'm going to be doing a demo here. So this is the introduction, but we are going to go straight into lab one where we set up the user. Here we're setting the environment because we know that free is the one we want. We're just gonna hit enter and leave it. We're now going to connect to our database, switch to the right CDB container. And we are going to reset our password. You can set it to whatever you want. I'm setting mine to this. Uh, we just have the user reset it for security reasons. And now that we have completed that, we are going to exit. On top of that, we are going to start up ORDS. So ORDS is the backbone of many different things, but for this workshop in particular, we're going to need ORDS so that we can run our integration with Apex later on. It's going to be the bonus lab. Now we move on to lab two, and this is where we continue to download the graph setup materials. I am going to go to the correct directory where we want to download everything. I'm going to do a wget to get the right zip package and get the right files. We'll check and see if they are the, indeed the correct files once we do this unzip. And we do see that everything is looking right. So now that that's been done, we are going to remove the original zip file that we got so we can clean it up a little. Now we are going to start up SQL Developer. SQL Developer is where we are going to be running the bulk of really all of our queries besides the Apex integration. So once you start it up, we're going to hit no for importing preferences and allow SQL Developer to continue initializing. We'll say OK to usage tracking. And now here, we want to set up a database connection to our HOL23C user. So to do so, we're going to hit this plus button in the upper left hand corner. And we're going to type this in. The name doesn't really matter. You can call it whatever you want. It's just a labels when you select it out of the list on the side later for connections. The username is HOL23C as we just shown earlier. And the password is whatever you had set it to in your lab one. So I'm putting what I had set mine to. And then here we're going to fill out the host name. The host name is a bit long. If you wanna see exactly the host name and the service name later when you're doing this, 
you can go back to the instructions and go to task three and it's going to have a screenshot with pretty much all the correct information that you would want to fill this out with besides your password that you had selected yourself but here i'm going to fill it out because i know what it is Port is 1521, service name is FreePDB1. We do a test, look at the status, it's empty, hit the test, success. So now we can connect to the user. It fills out the connection over here and then opens up a sheet where you can start executing queries. So now we are going to go into the next part, which is setting up our schema that means creating the tables, adding data, all that good stuff. So I'm going to go to File, Open, Home, Examples, Graph, and then Create Keys. That opens up this file, which takes care of a few different things. So it drops tables and graphs if they exist already, specifically the ones we'll be using in this workshop. There is the creation of two tables, which is bank accounts and bank transfers. So we're going to be a banking application in this context. And so these two tables just stores the account information of our users and then how they are transferring money to each other. So they have the account ID here, the name of the owner, and then the balance. This is the transaction ID, the source account ID, AKA where the money is coming from, and destination account ID, where the money is going to in these transfers. Also the description and the amount. We're going to be loading up these tables with these rows pulled in from CSVs that were unzipped earlier when we were doing setup. We're gonna add some constraints and then we're gonna verify these constraints. We'll click the script button right here to do so. Click OK for HOL23C connection. And here you're going to see that we have verified the constraints. We have the success of processing the data and adding it to the tables for both tables. We had dropped and created the necessary tables we'll be using. There is going to be an error that will pop up by default here. That is simply because the drop property graph um, bank graph line does not have a if exists statements. Basically in standard SQL, it says if the table exists, drop it. But we don't have that in our property graph query language, PGQ syntax yet. So it's just gonna throw an error if you try to drop a property graph that does not exist. That's okay, there's no issue. Okay, so cool, now we've done that and that completes the setup in the second lab. So now we're going to move into the third lab. So like I said, these are the two tables that we will be using as our underlying data. We're back in the correct tab and we're going to create the property graph now. A couple things about this syntax. So when we say create property graph, we're gonna select the name that we want here, which is bank graph. And we are going to be defining the vertex tables and the edge tables. So. Contrary to what standard SQL does, we are not gonna have relational tables with rows and columns in a property graph, or it's not structured the way that it typically is in a relational database. So in a normal relational table, you have rows and you have columns, but when you flip it to a graph, this graph is essentially a view that is overlaid onto your relational tables and it's using the same data, but it's going about how we utilize it very differently. So we take those rows and columns, we turn them into vertices and edges, essentially nodes connected by edges or lines that really just define the relationship between these nodes or vertices. And so we have Four vertices, we have bank accounts, 
and we have edges as bank transfers. So essentially we have all these bank accounts and the relationships we're defining them on in this graph is how they transfer money to each other, how money is being moved around between all these different accounts. And so we specify the vertices to be bank accounts with the key, the identifying key as the ID. The properties here, they're simply other columns of that same table, um, but they're included in the properties line so that you can query on them as well or use them to query, even if they're not what's identifying that bank account line, like the ID is. We have the edge tables, um, so that's bank transfers, and that's pretty much the same syntax as the ver vertex tables. The only real difference is, is imagine the transfers in between these accounts. We need to figure out where the money's coming from and where they're going to. And that's the point of the source key and the destination key. We're saying the source account ID is where it's coming from, and destination account is where it's going to with the money. And again, they have properties like the account IDs and the amounts, just so you can query based off of those two. So I'm gonna run that with this green play button here. It's gonna say property graph is created. So if you want to verify your property graph information or ever forget and you wanna look back, I'm gonna show you a few different queries that you can run so that you can take a look at that. This is select star from user property graphs, allows you to see all the property graphs that you have in your schema. If you want the DDL, AKA the entire block here that you use to write and create your property graph, if you ever wanna take a look at it again, you can run this query here. And you can see it's right there. If you want to see which tables were identified as vertices or edges within your graph, you can check here. You can see the name, the table, and what kind of element it is. Oh, oops, just ran that one. And then finally, if you wanted to see which properties that a graph has, you can check here. For bank graph, we have the vertices over here with ID name balance as properties. And then for transfers, we have the account IDs and amount. So that's all looking correct. Uh, very handy if you ever forget something. So keep those in mind. Now we're actually going to go into the bulk of the queries that we're using today. Accounts who have had the most incoming transfers out of all of the accounts in our bank graph. So how are we going to do that? We're gonna do that using PGQ. And so what you can see from this query, it looks like standard SQL syntax for a lot of it, but the difference is right in the middle. You can see this graph table operator allowing you to put this graph query in. So it's saying from the bank graph, match this pattern. We're looking for the most incoming transfer, uh, the accounts with the most incoming transfers. And so here we point out the source vertex inside these rounded parentheses. So a source account transferring money to a destination account. You can uh, denote the edges by seeing what's in between these arrows and these square brackets right here. And this is another vertex. So from that pattern being matched, a transfer from a source account to a destination account, something we would also call a one hop chain, we would return the query output as specific columns. So we're returning this destination vertex as account ID. And then in what's displayed to us, we're going to select the account ID. So you can see here the number of transfers. At the very top, we have 387, 934, and 135. They are the most incoming transfers in our entire graph. So this isn't too alarming yet, but something we really want to pay attention to because it is quite uncommon, seeing as they are the most. They're very, very high on the list. So we are going to find something else. Now we're not just looking for a single transfer, not a single one hop transfer. We are going to be looking at something we refer to as two hop transfers. 
or a two hop chain. So right here, you can see that the source vertex is in this parentheses and it's transferring to an account and this account is transferring to another account. That's what we call two hops because there are two transfers involved in this chain. So what we're interested in is the money flowing through. So what accounts are having money flowed, flown, flowed through them? Um, essentially, we are going to return that as a column here. They're the conduits in here. They're the ones who have money coming in, but money going out. And once again, we see 387 and 934 at the very top of this list. So it is a bit suspicious and it is getting increasingly suspicious. So now that we see that 387 shows up in both, let's list the accounts that received a transfer from 387 in one, two or three hops. So what's slightly different about this query? Well, we do have the standard graph pattern matching, but here to denote the fact that we want to look for chains of length one, two, or three hops, we can just put it in these curly brackets right here, one comma three. And that's the range that we're looking for, or the range of number of hops that we're looking for. Additionally, we also input this where clause so you can filter on the IDs, the ID for V1 to be 387. And you can see that here what's returned is that many, many, many accounts have received a transfer from 387. Super, super interesting. Really like not too many people who are well networked enough to be transferring money to that many different accounts. So that is definitely getting more and more suspicious. Oh, before we move on, actually, I wanted to show you something here. So the beauty of this shortened syntax, how you can so easily search for chains or whatnot in one, two or three hops so easily with literally just typing a few characters and you could do so in less than a minute. If you were to try to write the equivalent query in SQL, in regular SQL, this would take you a lot of lines because if you're searching for just a one hop chain, maybe that's a few lines, but you're looking for two, you're going up to 10 lines of code. You're going up to three, that's over 20 lines of code just to find three hops. And that only exponentially gets larger the more and more you go up. So it's a real pain to write in regular SQL. And this just makes it so easy for you. But I also want to make it clear that 23AI is, of course, a converged database. Um, so regular SQL and PGQ will be available by default within the SQL, um, sorry, within the Oracle database, as it is a converged database containing all of this functionality in one. So you can utilize both depending on your use cases. So now we're going to move forward and we're going to work on cycles. So cycles are really similar to a chain of transactions. So the only real difference is, is that the beginning and ending accounts are supposed to be the same account in a cycle. So instead of a chain, it's basically a loop. It closes back up. In this case, we're looking for a three hop cycle, a triangle. So it's a source account, sending money to an account, sending money to another account, but ultimately sending that money back to the same account that started this entire chain, this entire cycle, I mean. So we're running that here. And you can see that there's really not many accounts that have had triangles, very few, even at the most, because as I said, just not a very common transaction chain for a normal person. So how about we try four, a four hop cycle. Okay, we see the numbers increase a little. We see eight, seven at the top. And quite uh, a few accounts that are involved. But what if we were to take it up a notch and do five hop cycles? Uh, 
Okay, so now we see quite a bit more and we see our beloved accounts 387, 934, and 135 all at the very top once again. Of course, it is very, very suspicious. Um, there is even less reason to explain why you might be sending money in a cycle as opposed to a chain. Because at least in a chain, it would make sense to send the money to accounts along the way for it to be spent somewhere else. But if the money is starting and ending in the same account, now that's just highly suspicious because it seems that the money was not even being spent by these other accounts. Why transfer the money around? So I am going to try another query and say, now that we know there are three, four, and five hop cycles, why not we just list, why don't we just list any 10 accounts that have had these circular payment chains? So this is any 10, not necessarily the top. And of course, it returns 10 accounts. So let's refine this a little further. Let's do the accounts that have circular payment chains of three, four, or five, but order it by the ones with the most cycles at the top. And of course, we see 135, 37, 934, all at the top. Now, this is super suspicious, like I said, uh, for those reasons of there's just not really seemingly a purpose why a normal person would need to send money around in a cycle like this. However, in certain malicious transactions with bad actors in your system, perhaps they are hackers trying to take money from accounts and then shuffle it around so that it can't be found. But then it comes back to the owner of the original account, the original hacker, so that they can get the money. Or if people are sending money to offshore accounts, money is bouncing around over there. So it goes from your account to your offshore account to another offshore account around around in a circle and gets sent back to your original account so that you can launder that money. Now that is also a fraudulent transaction you can detect. And ultimately what you want to know from that is how do I utilize this? It's so that you can flag these accounts. Perhaps you want to flag them for inspection. Perhaps you need to check in with them to see if these are authorized transactions. And this is an automated way or scripted way that you could utilize graphs to detect those transactions without so much hassle, right? A lot of these queries, they didn't even require more than five lines of code. So that is how you can utilize graph to be extremely useful in your applications for fraud. In this section, we will go over how the bank graph updates when rows in the bank transfer tables are inserted. When we created the bank graph, we essentially created a view on the underlying tables and metadata, so no data was duplicated. Any inserts, updates, or deletes on the underlying tables will also be reflected in the property graph. Now let's insert some more data into the bank transfers table and we will be able to see that when rows are inserted into the bank transfers table, the bank graph is also updated. So let's go ahead and copy our first query and paste it into SQL Developer. And we're going to run script since we have multiple rows we're entering. So in this case, we're adding one transfer ending in account 934 and five transfers ending in account 135. Let's go ahead and rerun the top 10 queries to see if there are any changes after inserting rows in the bank transfer table. So this is basically the first query that we ran at the beginning. And let's go ahead and run it. And as you guys can see, account 135 went from 36 transfers to 41. Account 934 went from 39 to 40 transfers. And then we have account 135 leading, even though it was in third place when we first ran this query. So we can confirm that the bank transfer tables were updated with our new inserts. We're going to insert more rows into our transfer table, but to give another example of how our bank graph continues to update without any need to recreate the graph, let's check to see if account 39 is currently a part of a four hop circular payment chain. So to do that, we're going to run this query. And as we're able to see, 
it is not involved in any four hub circular payment chains. So let's go ahead and insert some rows now into the bank transfers table. So as you guys can see, we're inserting some transfers from account 599, 982, and 487 into account 39. Let's go ahead and run the script. And it looks like they were inserted. So let's go ahead and rerun the previous query that was checking for the four hub circular payment chain. So running this, we're able to see that now our value went from zero to five. So we can confirm that those transfers were inserted into our table. We inserted three rows and that resulted in five circular payment chains of length four. So let's examine why. Let's run the following query to find three hub chains from account 39 to one of the other accounts. So there are two chains from account 39 to account 407 and another two chains from account 39 to 559. So when we inserted a transfer from account 407 to account 39, that resulted in two four hub chains and the same occurred with account 559. That is why we now have five new four hub circular payment chains. Let's go ahead and delete all of the rows we've just inserted. To do so, we're going to run this query and we can now move on to the bonus lab that is basically integrating graphs with Apex. So to do that, we are going to start by opening a new window in Google Chrome and copying this URL. We're going to sign in with our admin user and password that is specified in the instructions. Okay, and now it will prompt us to change the password. So we can go ahead and change the password to whatever we want. Let's go ahead and click and change. And then we are going to go ahead and create our workspace. So the name of our workspace is going to be graph. We can leave everything else as is. And then we're going to specify that we want to reuse an existing schema. We're going to be using the one that we created in SQL Developer. As you can see, we're able to select it. And let's go ahead and click Next. Our admin username is going to be admin. And then we can specify a password. And we can add our email address. OK, if everything looks good, we're going to go ahead and click on Create Workspace and click on Done. And then let's go ahead and sign out from our admin space and login into our workspace with our credentials. It will prompt us to change our password again. So we can go ahead and do that. And click on change password. And now we're going to move on to importing our application. So to do that, we're going to click on App Builder. And we're going to click on Import. Click in this tile and go to Home, Examples, and Graph. That is where we have all of our files for this workshop. And we're going to select the f106.sql file. We can go ahead and click Next. And we can go ahead and reuse the application ID 106 from the imported application. Let's click Install Application and Install Supporting Objects. Now that the supported objects are installed, let's go ahead and click on Run Application and signing into our application using our credentials. Okay, 
So now that we're signed in, we're able to see a little bit about our prerequisites and we're also able to see that there's two tiles for this application. We have property graph queries with SQL and then we have using the graph visualization plugin. So let's click on property graph queries with SQL. And this basically helps us see how we can visualize our queries as tables in Apex. For example, we have the top 10 accounts um, by number of incoming transfers. This query is showing um, the amount of times a certain account is used as an intermediate node. We have our hub chains queries. And we also have the list of six hub circular payment chains starting from account 39. As you guys can see in here, our starting account is 39 and our ending account is 39. And these are the intermediate nodes used to transfer money from account 39 back into account 39 in six hops. And it also gives you the option of inserting rows into your bank transfers table. And that would be basically refreshed and updated into this table. But let's go ahead and move on to visualizing our graph. One of the biggest and nicest features of graph is being able to visualize your queries as a graph. It depends on what you prefer, but in this example, we're just visualizing our queries. And as you guys can see in here, we have top 10 accounts at center of a two hub transfer. And if you are able to take a look at this graph, you'll be able to see or identify really quick which top 10 accounts are the ones that we're taking a look at. The top 10 accounts are red nodes or vertices, and they have an icon of a dollar bill. So very easy to identify at first glance. And if we right click on them, we're actually able to see the properties of our vertices or our nodes. As you can see here, our account number is 746. We also have the owner of the account and we also have the balance of the account. In here, we're also able to see a query showing us accounts with four hop chains. So even though it might be hard for us to understand this visualization, if you look at the edges, you're able to see that pattern of four hops chains. And lastly, we also have our account in a six hop circular payment chain from account 39. So in here, it's pretty easy to identify account 39. That will be this one. And we're also able to see the hops, which accounts were used to transfer the money back into account 39. This is the end of our hands-on demo. I hope you guys have learned something about graphs. If you guys want to go ahead and try this demonstration, it is available in Live Labs. So definitely make sure to check Live Labs. We do have other hands-on labs. So have fun with graphs and thank you very much for your time.